Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminder that we are not alone. We thank you that you go before us in the battles of life. And so I pray, Father, that as we look in this passage, that you would again speak to us for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the sad stories that came out last week was concerning a lady named Michaela Flores. She was in the Las Vegas shooting. She was able to escape that to go home to her house in Santa Rosa, only to have it burned down the following week. When she was interviewed on CNN, she said, last Sunday I was running from bullets, this Sunday I was running from fire. Um, our, our nation has been going through a lot. And maybe for some of you, you've been going through a lot. And you could relate to what David says in 2 Samuel 22, 5, when he says, For the waves of death encompass me. Or just like Michaela Flores and just like David, there are times when it seems like waves of problems come our way. And it's relentless. It never stops. It's one problem after another after another. Now, it's not just the Las Vegas shooting and, and the fires. It's also um, hurricanes and uh, earthquakes. And you name it, it seems like there are waves of problems that have been coming upon the world. And maybe you feel that way this morning. Maybe it feels like you're underwater and there's waves that keep coming at you. And you, you bob your head up and there's another wave of problem that seems to engulf you and overwhelm you. The question is, what do you do? What do you do when these waves are relentless? These waves of problems keep coming your way. How do you respond? In the passage that we read, David tells us how. He shows us how he responded when these waves of death encompassed him. The context of this psalm is David's encounter with Saul the second time that he spared his life. It was in the, near the hill country of Ziph where Saul, finding out that David was around, once again got 3,000 of his soldiers and he went after David. He was on the hill of Hakila when David sneaks up on him uh, along with two other men, Abishai and Ahimelech, the Hittite. And as they come upon the camp, all the soldiers were sleeping and God Put him in a deep sleep. They got to the middle of the camp. They saw Saul's unmistakable spear on the ground. They saw his water jug. And Abishai said to David, David, this is your chance. Take him out. David says, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. And Abishai goes, okay, let me do it then. <laughs> David says, no, uh, we will not touch the Lord's anointed. And it was in this context, it was in this encounter with, with Saul where, again, God spared David from the hand of Saul, that David writes this song of praise. In 1 Samuel 26, uh, 26, uh, not 264, 26, thus, Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. So David, as he encountered Saul said, God delivered me from you, and may he deliver me from all other tribulations, from all other problems, from all other trials. And he writes about this in 2 Samuel 22, verse 1. Now, if you're familiar with the psalm, this is actually also found in Psalm 18. But in Psalm 18, it is meant for the congregation to sing. In 2 Samuel 22, verse 1, it is David's personal acknowledgement of God's faithfulness in his life. David, an old man now, looks back at God's faithfulness and he looks back at this particular instance when God saved him from the hand of Saul and he gives praise to God. It says in verse 1, And David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of of Saul. In verse 2, he begins to describe God's mighty deliverance on his life. 
He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. That word is, is key in understanding this passage because it, it occurs six times. It, it was God's way of, it, it means God who rescued him out of danger, who took him out of the, the conflict, the situation that was, he was in. He was my deliverer. Verse 3. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. As David was running away from King Saul, he was going from cave to cave. And he used the cave as an analogy of God's protection upon him. And as much as the the cave was, uh, was a stronghold for him, he understood that ultimately it was God who protected him. That it was God who kept, kept him saved. It was God who saved him from the violence of Saul's soldiers. Verse 4. How do you respond when you are running away from danger? How do you respond when you run away from bullets and run away from fire and, and waves of death come upon you? This is what David says. And let's read it together. It's a great verse. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. David says, understand that whatever you're going through, that God is worthy to be praised. In fact, he says at the end of chapter 22, for this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing praises to your name. What is our response when waves of death encompass us? It is to praise the Lord. In this passage, five instances when we, where we could praise the Lord. First of all, we can praise the Lord in our, in our distress because he hears us. We can praise the Lord when we are in distress because he hears us. Verse 5. For the waves of death encompass me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. He he gives this illustration of water, of drowning in water, uh, of being in a turbulent um, ocean or turbulent lake. And he, he uses it as an analogy of the people who were against him. The word torrents of destruction is interesting Because it comes from the word Belial, which is worthless. Where have we heard that before? Nabal was a worthless person. Sheba was a worthless person. And so what the author is saying, what David is saying, is not that he needed rescuing from dangerous waters, but really he needed rescuing from dangerous people. And he says in verse 6, the cords of Seol entangled me. Again, the picture is like seaweeds that are, that are going around you and that, that has, that's pulling you down. The snares of death confronted me. Verse 7, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I called from his temple. Now notice what he says. He heard my voice and my cry came. To his ears. Why do we praise God? We praise God because he hears us in our distress. He hears your cry to him. He's listening when, you, when, you're, when you're crying to him. And you're saying, Lord, please help me. He hears that. He welcomes that. He understands what you're going through. He, and he invites you to his presence. Whenever you find yourself in distress, the the, the response is not just to praise God, it is to come to Him and to call to Him for help because He hears you. Secondly, we praise God not only because He hears us, we praise God because He's able to help us. We see not only the distress of David, we see the defender of David. And here, David begins to paint a picture of a God who's mighty, a God who's able to save, a God who's willing to save, And to work on his behalf. Notice how he describes God in verse 8. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. And he he shows God who's able to shake the heavens, who's able to shake 
the earth on behalf of his children. Verse 9. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. And he shows God who, who appears in a, in an what's the word, scary manner or who terrifies his enemies. I guess it's the best way to describe it. Verse 10. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen on the wings of the winds. He, it shows God riding the hurricane, riding the, riding the storm. Verse 12, he made darkness around him, his canopy, thick clouds, a gathering of water. David was painting a picture of, of a God who's in control of the universe, who's in control of the forces of nature, who is sovereign and, and it is willing to work on behalf of his children who call upon him. Verse 13. Out of the brightness of his, before him, coals of fire flame forth. And here he begins to describe lightning and, and thunder. Verse 14, the Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and rotted them. I know about you when I was uh, growing up, lightning and thunder were kind of scary, aren't they? You know, when you hear it, when the first time you hear it as a kid, you go, what's that? Because it rumbles. And actually, you're, you're able to see the, the, the flashes of lightning first. Then you hear that rumbling. And you're wondering, what is that? Well, David was describing that. And he was saying that that's, uh, the God is in control of, of nature. And he's powerful. And that's how he appears to my enemies. Verse 16. Again, David goes back to the water analogy. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundation of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He was like a lifeguard that, that picked me up from, um, from me drowning. He, he saved me as I was sinking. Verse 18. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for there were too many for me. You know, they were like, D David was describing the enemies like, Bullies who, who, who were picking on him, who were too numerous for him, too strong for him. But God was the one who rescued him. Uh, verse 19, they confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. The Lord was my support. Um, I think it's uh, one time I, I saw this video clip of a um, mountain lion. Uh, chasing after this bear cub. And finally, the bear cub, you know, faced him because he, he, he couldn't go anywhere else. And the bear cub, you know, with his tiny mouth, opened his mouth and tried to roar. And the mountain lion left. And it's like, wow, you know, you're surprised. But right behind the, the bear cub was the mother cub going like this. <laughs> That's kind of what David was picturing. Uh, there were too many for me. But they fled from me. Why? Because God was behind me. God was supporting me. God had my back. Okay. When, when David was being tempted to kill uh, Saul on the ground, this is what he said to Abishai. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Now notice David's trust in God. This is what David said about King Saul. At this point, David was just homeless. He was just going from cave to cave. He was a nomad. But his trust in God was this. Even though he was against this powerful king who had thousands of soldiers who were chasing him, this is David's trust in God. He says in verse 10 of 1 Samuel 26, and David says, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. That was the last time David encountered Saul. What happened to Saul? He went into battle at Gilboa, and what happened? He perished because of the Philistines' attack. And so David was saying that even though I, I face these powerful enemies, my trust remains in the Lord as the Lord lives. And he'll talk about that later on, that, that David knew that his God is alive, that God knew what he was going through. 
and that he didn't need to take matters into his own hand. Third, and this is the most difficult part of this passage, uh, because it seems like David was bragging about his righteousness. And so, and so we need to, to look at it carefully. We see the delight in David. We can praise God because of his grace in our lives. Verse 20, and many times you'll see verse 20 separated from verse 21 as they divide up the chapter. You can't do that. You have to put verse 20 right before 21, and you need to see 21 and the rest of the verses in the context of verse 20. What does verse 20 say? He brought me out into this broad place. So from the water, now he talks, he talks about dry ground. He brings me to a place where I could rest. He brings me to a place of a blessing and restfulness. He says, he rescued me. Now, here's the reason. Why did God rescue David? He rescued me because he delighted in me. Remember what we said at the very beginning of our study in the life of David? The only way that you could understand David's life is to interpret a man after God's own heart, not as David's heart for God, but God's heart for David. God did not choose David because he was special. David was special because God chose David. It stemmed from God's heart. It was God's grace. David was a nobody. He was the youngest among the brothers. He was a shepherd. But because God chose him, David rose up into prominence. David defeated Goliath. And David eventually became king. Why did God save David? Because God delighted in him. And it is in the context of this that you understand the next verses. I'll just read the, the next verses. And, you know, it, it might seem strange knowing what we know about David. But that's why you need to connect to verse 20. Um, oh, by the way, before that, in, in 1 Samuel 26, 18, the context of what David is about to say is specifically tied to his encounter with Saul. In 26, 18, when Saul woke up and David showed him the spear and the water jug, he said, why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? David was saying, I am innocent in my dealings with you. Not once, not once have I sinned against you, King Saul. Why are you trying to kill me? And so in, it's in the context of God delighting in David, and it's in the context of David's dealing specifically with Saul that we un understand the next verses. Verse 21. Back to our text. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands. He rewarded me. If you don't put that in context, it will throw you off. I read so many commentaries, and they were having a hard time dealing with it because this chapter 22 is after David and Bathsheba and David and Uriah. How could he, how could he write this? But you got to put it in context, in historical context, and you got to put it in light of the fact that it is God who blesses David. Okay, let's move on. Verse 22. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from guilt. If you're tying this in with Uriah and Bathsheba, then you're in trouble. You won't understand it. This was a specific reference to a historical encounter with King Saul. Verse 25. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanliness in his sight. But notice, even as David says that, he acknowledges that it is God's grace that enables him to do this. How do we know that? Um, well, before that, I keep going ahead of myself. I get so excited to tell you about what the, the interpretation Going back to 26, David says, For the Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. So as he was talking to Saul, says, God, God has kept me from, from dying from your hands. 
because God was pleased in the fact that I did nothing wrong to you, King Saul. And so that's the context. Um, it says, gave me into your hands, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. So that, that's, the, that's the context. So verse 26, David says, God, God blesses uh, obedience. God blesses trust in him. And so he says, with the merciful, you, so, you show yourself merciful. And with the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. And, and here you begin to see David acknowledging God's grace. With the purified. And David was saying, Lord, it is you who purifies me. With the purified, you, de you deal purely. With the crooked, you make yourself seem tortuous. In other words, you frustrate the plans of the wicked man. Saul, with all his soldiers, with all his spies, could never catch up to David. Ahithophel, with all his wisdom, was, was his, his wise counsel was turned by God into foolishness. And so that's what David was saying. Verse 28. And here you begin again to see the secret of David's life. He says, you save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. And what is the key? To salvation. What is the key to God working in David's life? David was humble before the Lord. He acknowledged his need before the Lord. Verse 29. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. You, you show me what to do, Lord. You are the lamp. So instead of thinking of a David bragging about himself. No, it is David bragging about what God has done in his life. Verse 30. For by you I can run against a troop, and, and my God, I can leap over my wall, a wall. Now notice, again, for by you and by my God, I can do all these things. Verse 31, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. Who is God but, but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? Important again to see, what was David tempted to do when he was wandering around in the desert. It was to turn his back on God. That's why David says to, to Saul, this is the most egregious thing that you did to me. It's not trying to take my life. It is removing me from the company of godly people so that now I'm tempted to turn to other gods. He says, now therefore let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has steered you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is men, may they be cursed before God. For they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. That's why it's so important for David to affirm in this psalm that I have no God but God. I serve no one but the true God. Why? Because he was tempted on that day. To turn us back on the true God and to worship other gods. That ever happened to you? That when you have problems, the, the feeling is, God, if you really exist, why did this happen? You ever tempted to think that way? Maybe not about your particular problem, but when you see the problems of the world. When you see innocent people getting shot. When you see houses being burned. When you see lives being lost, you, you, are you ever tempted to say, Lord, if you're real, if you're there, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to other people? You ever tempted to do that? Well, David's response was this. When he was being tempted to go after other gods. And let's read this together because this was David's affirmation that it's not going to happen. It will not happen to him. Verse 32. Let's read it again. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? And so David says that God is the true God. God, there is no God but Yahweh. And that needs to be our response. That in the midst of trials, when, when waves of death encompass us, we need to affirm our faith in the true God. God, I don't always understand, but I know who you are. And I keep my faith in you. I keep my eyes on you. And my faith remains strong in you. Verse 20, 33. He says, this God is a strong refuge 
and has made my way blameless. And so you need to understand that David was rewarded for his righteousness, but he is righteous because God delighted in him. He is righteous because God purified him. He is righteous because God made his way blameless. How does that happen? It happens when you humbly admit your need for God. In verse 28, again, we read this already. But he says, you save a humble people. Not a proud people demanding things of God. But a humble people saying, Lord, we don't know everything. But we trust you. We know that you know what you're doing. And Lord, we humble ourselves before you. So give us your grace. Give us your mercy. Lord, save us. Because he saves what? A humble people. I was reading um, Janelle's blog. By the way, I encourage you to read her blog. As she goes around the world, uh, just interesting. This is what she says. I love it. Her first, her first entry, the, the key to vulnerability, she says, I cannot describe a greater strength than to remove pride and adorn grace. Isn't that wonderful? I cannot describe a greater strength than to remove pride and adorn grace. And one of the people who responded quoted from um, Donald Miller. And I love, I love the, the quote as well. It says, grace only sticks to our imperfections. Those who can't accept their imperfections can't accept grace either. Beautiful quote. That grace only sticks to imperfection. Grace is available to those who are humble. It reminded me of another quote. One more quote. Um, Philip Yancey. It says, grace like water flows to the lowest part. Grace, like water, flows to the lowest part. Why is it that people are not saved? Because they're too proud to admit that they're sinners. They're too proud to admit their need of God. Deeds of David. So we we praise God because he hears in our distress. We praise God because he helps. We praise God because of his grace in our life. We praise God because he gives us victory. He says, he made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. In other words, he strengthened David. You have given him the, the shield of your salvation and your gentleness made me great. You, have, you gave a wide place for my steps. Another reference to a wide place. Another reference to um, the enlargement of David's territory. And my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemy and destroyed them and did not turn back until they were consumed. I consumed them. I thrust them through so that they did not rise. They fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for my battle. It was God who gave David strength. It was God who, who when he was fighting uh, Goliath, it was David who said, The battle is the Lord's. So you made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me, those who hate me, and I destroyed them. Now, for some people, this disturbs them. They go, well, Pastor, isn't that kind of harsh? David destroying all these people? Well, a couple of things you need to keep in mind. That David was being used as God's instrument, a holy God's instrument, to mete out judgment on an ungodly nation and a wicked people. And so he was destroying nations that if he left Stan would have destroyed Israel, not only from the outside uh, through warfare, but to influence them to idolatry, to influence them to worship other gods. Why is it important to keep Israel safe? Because it is through Israel, it is through David's line that Messiah will come who will one day be born and will save the whole world. And so the destruction of these ungodly people was actually God's act of mercy upon the world. Okay. What else do we see here? Uh, finally, the doxology of David. <clears throat> we praise God because nations need to hear about God's salvation. <clears throat> during times of distress, during times of trials, we need to praise God because people need to hear the truth. 
about who God is and what he's able to do. Notice in verse 47, the Lord lives. What did David say when he was, when he was talking to, to King Saul? As the Lord lives. Here, again, he repeats those words. The Lord lives. What does that mean? It means your God is alive. He is not dead. God is alive. And he's not even tired. <laughs> so God, the Lord lives. Blessed be my rock and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. The God who gave me vengeance and brought down people under me, who brought me out of my enemies. You exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from the, the man of violence. Verse 50, for this I will praise you. David began with, the Lord is worthy to be praised. At the end, as he recounts not only his encounters with Saul, his encounters with other enemies of, of God, he says, for this I will praise you. He bookends this story, this marvelous story of his life with praise. He says, for this I will praise you, O Lord, and something else. He says, among the nations and sing praises to your name. Why does God deliver us? Why does God save us? So that the nations can hear about his salvation. Verse 51, and with this we'll end. He says, great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. Why is it that God made David, David's way blameless? I think, Psalm 23, verse 3, is a good answer. Let's read it together. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He did it so that God will be honored. God purified David for his name's sake. God made David righteous for his name's sake. God made David's way blameless. For his name's sake. God worked a miracle of grace in David's life so that God's name will be honored. God saved you. God blessed you. Not just so that you could be comfortable and, and know that anytime you die, you'll go to heaven. God saved you so that his name will be honored and so that the nations, the people who don't know him, will hear about the marvelous name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What is our response when waves of death seem to follow us? When we're running away from whether it's bullets or fire or illness or homelessness or uh, layoffs or foreclosures? Well, what is our response? It is to praise God. Why? Because God is worthy of praise. We praise him in our distress because he hears us. Uh, we, we praise him because he helps us. We praise him because of his grace in our life. We praise him because he gives us victory over our enemies. And we praise him so that the nations can hear of his salvation. God delivers me so I can praise him and share his salvation to the nations. Let me end with this verse. It says, the Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. David talked of salvation as a personal possession. And I'm wondering this, this morning, do you possess salvation? Could you say without a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? That if you were to, if you were in Las Vegas and not make it, or if you were in Santa Rosa and not have made it, where would you go after you die? David says in Psalm 26, verse 3, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Where will you be in eternity? Do you possess salvation? Would you like to have it? Let's pray. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if today you've come and you can't say without a shadow of a doubt that you will be in the house of the Lord forever. I want you to be sure. Our worship leader ended his exhortation by saying,
quoting the fact that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that no one goes to the Father except through him. And so this morning, if you'd like to do that, if you'd like to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, would you follow me in this simple prayer, just quietly where you're at, that expresses your faith and trust in God? Just pray this prayer with me, just quietly in your heart. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. I hear and now put my faith in you alone as my Lord and as my Savior. Come into my life. Come into my heart and save me. Cleanse me from all my sin. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Father, I thank you for anyone who, who prayed that prayer. And I pray, Father, that you would help them to grow in their, in their knowledge of you. Maybe you are a believer and you're going through problems and trials. And uh, maybe you don't understand why you're going through it. But maybe like David, our response today is just to say, Lord, whatever it is that's happening in my life, Lord, I know that you are worthy. You are worthy to be praised. So even before you hear the answer from God, would you just praise him right now? Would you just acknowledge who he is, that he is a sovereign God, that he is a loving God, that he is a faithful God, that he is a wise God, that he is a God who's seated on the throne? Father, we thank you for speaking to our hearts today, and I pray, Father, that you would continue to bless us as we leave this place for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This time, let's all rise and let's all sing our...